Contrary to what you might have heard, colorblindness is not a black and white condition. First of all, colorblindness is kind of a misnomer as an umbrella term, because it suggests that every included color vision abnormality is effectively colorless and synonymous to the most severe cases like monochromacy or achromatopsia. Color vision deficiency is a much better umbrella term, because it considers that not every anomalous color vision is created equal. Most people who have a color vision deficiency do not see the world in black and white. In fact, they can still see colors and hues, just not as many as normal trichromats. Color vision deficiency is a spectrum including many different types and many different intermediate severities. In this video I'm going to focus on a subset of color vision deficiencies, specifically the range between anomalous trichromacy to dichromacy, in order to give you a thorough understanding of what it actually means to be color vision deficient. As a prime example, I'm going to focus on the severity spectrum of protanomaly. Protanomaly, or also called red deficiency, is a red-green color vision deficiency that denotes an anomalous long wavelength or L-cone type in the eye's retina. Its abnormal functionality can be caused by a few different conditions, but let's take the literal non-functionality of the affected cones as an example for the sake of simplicity. For a visual demonstration of their functionality, we are going to take a section of the eye's retina and look at how the L cones change with each severity of protanomaly. Each person's cone type population in the retina is slightly different, but we are going to use the standard distribution as an example. This is roughly 60% L cones, 30% M cones and 10% S cones. As you can see by the relative amount of M cones and S cones, you can get away with a relatively low population density and still be able to partially functionally see the cone types associated primary color and its mixes. For example, pure blue naturally is a very dark hue compared to green or yellow because of the direct relationship between the population density of a cone type and its introduced luminance. Yet, you can still see blue as its own color despite the S cones just amounting to around 10% of the cones inside the retina. Your brain is incredible at reading out color information. Even a 50% decrease in the population density of the L cone type would not effectively make you color vision deficient yet. In fact, the subjective loss of color discriminability follows an exponential fall off curve. Your L cones must be increasingly non-functional for your color vision to count as one of the more severe cases of color vision deficiency. And this behavior makes sense. After all, if your L cone functionality is at a high percentage to begin with, a few percentages missing won't make that much of a dent. Next, we need to understand how color discriminability actually changes in protanomaly in order to simulate it for normal trichromats. Fortunately, we can keep this simple because the main concept of color that changes between the integer color vision dimensions is hue. All the other concepts like saturation and luminance only change indirectly in relation to hue. In monochromacy, for example, there's no concept of hue. Hue literally doesn't exist there and everything is either black, grey or white. The first introduction to hue comes in dichromacy, where hue is zero-dimensional. In any dichromacy, there are just two singular hues that can only mix by going through the achromatic colors white, grey and black. For example, a proto-nope can only see yellowish and bluish as their two hues. In trichromacy hue becomes one-dimensional, meaning there's a line or circle of distinct hues. While a dichromat can only distinguish two singular hues, a trichromat can already functionally distinguish between more than a hundred named distinct hues. This exponential increase in hue discriminability continues in tetrachromacy, where hue is literally two-dimensional and can only fit on a plane or the whole surface of a sphere. So, with each additional functional cone type, there's a dimensional increase in the concept of hue. White and black, however, although white becomes subjectively and comparatively brighter each time, conceptually stay the same throughout these color vision dimensions. Only the concept of hue increases dimensionally. Understanding this specific dimensional behavior of color vision regarding hue is important, because it helps us more easily simulate the different severities of protanomaly. 
This means, in order to simulate protonomaly, we can gradually decrease the dimension of hue by transitioning from the full spectrum of trichromatic hues towards the two singular hues of dichromacy. All the other colors just need to logically follow this hue decline and they will automatically be correct also. We can map the resulting spectrum of various intermediate anomalous spectra as a two-dimensional image that looks like this. At the top you can see the normal trichromatic hue spectrum and at the bottom there's the spectrum as seen with strong protanomaly, that is a total red blindness. All the intermediate spectra show the different severities of this form of protanomaly. We will use this handy image in conjunction with my recently released application Custom Color Vision to easily and functionally simulate all of these intermediate stages of protanomaly. Furthermore, it has to be said that in the following, I'm assuming a linear relationship between population density and color discriminability, meaning that 50% L-cone functionality results in 50% of the original brightness of the red color dimension, for example. Of course, this is a huge simplification, but it's close enough to reality that we can use this simplified relationship as a faithful example. The further we look down in this insightful image here, the more the normal hues are assimilated to either yellow, blue, white or black. This assimilation follows strict logical rules and is not random. To put it simply, the L-cone type introduces a reddish color dimension, when it becomes less and less functional due to a quantitative or qualitative decrease of its cones all the hues and colors that you get by mixing in red slowly but surely collapse to their versions without red. For example, magenta, which is a mix of blue and red, collapses to blue since red diminishes, and yellow, as another example, technically collapses to green, since it's missing red. However, in this case, I'm displaying it as a yellowish color for the sake of simplicity and to demonstrate its color opponency to blue. Whether the M-cone type's color quality is simulated with the green-yellow or another hue that's sufficiently different from blue doesn't matter that much in this case, as long as all the substitute colors are in a dichromatic context and roughly equiluminant to the expected relative luminance levels of the cone type's color qualities. With all of these considerations in mind, we are now well equipped to explore the main question of this video. How colorblind do you have to be to start failing a colorblind test? If you have an extreme severity of protanomaly, which is called protanopia, answering this question is quite easy. With protanopia, you will fully fail a colorblind test every time. However, as we've learned today, there are many different severities of protanomaly. Generally, these severities are categorized into mild, moderate and strong color vision deficiencies. Naturally, the following L-cone functionality percentages for each severity are approximations and depend on many different additional considerations. For a protanomaly to count as mild, your L-cone functionality needs to be about 10% of the standard. Every intermediate protanomaly between 99 and 10% L-cone functionality technically still counts as a color vision deficiency, but roughly until you reach the 10% threshold, your color vision is not dysfunctional enough for you to really notice that you have a color vision deficiency in most cases until it has been thoroughly tested. For example, with around 20% L-cone functionality, colors and hues look a bit pale or dark. But color and hue discriminability isn't yet impaired enough to warrant major struggles with color. With the S-cones as a prime example, they also just comprise about 10% of the retinous cone population, yet you can still see blue. So it makes sense that a mere 10% L-cone functionality is still enough to see red, although your color discriminability naturally shifts and becomes worse. As a higher percentage example, with simply a 50% L-cone functionality colors may look a bit weird and unusual here and there, but other than that, you'll still be able to distinguish colors relatively normally, since it's just a very minor impairment. The L-cone type needs to be pretty significantly impaired to cause many of the difficulties that we associate with color vision deficiencies. As a consequence, to start failing at a colorblind test, we need to start conducting such a test with about 10% L-cone functionality, even if that percentage sounds really small. 
only then it starts to become noticeably more difficult as a normal trichromat to see the numbers on some of the test plates that target protonomaly. You will still be able to identify a good amount of numbers, but it has become more ambiguous than before, and you have to concentrate a bit. As a more straightforward comparison, when green and yellow are put directly next to each other, for example, they are still very different. But once they are not in such a direct color context, you'll encounter some difficulties distinguishing them. The same is true for other colors like blue and magenta or cyan and white, as well as many more colors. Nonetheless, despite these challenges, you can still distinctly see most of the trichromatic hues, just with less contrast. If you are a normal trichromat and you currently already find it difficult to distinguish these mildly protonopic colors, that's okay. You have to remember that someone born with protonomaly has lived with it for a long time and has had enough time to get used to spotting these relatively small color differences and develop coping mechanisms, unlike you. Needing some time to familiarize yourself with such a more challenging color vision is normal. Next up, for a protonomaly to count as moderate, your L-cone functionality needs to be around 5% of the standard, give or take a few percentages. With such a moderate protonomaly, you'll start to encounter a lot more difficulties with color. While yellow and green still look more or less distinct in a direct comparison, when they are not directly beside each other, it becomes rather difficult to tell them apart. The same is true for cyan, which now starts to look more like an off-white and not like a distinct hue anymore. Purple just disappears completely without any traces, which is why it's a running joke in the colorblind community that purple is a lie. Reds and oranges, although still distinct, become very dark and converge towards a dark yellowish color. Effectively, all the intermediate hues between red, green and blue start to fade into near indistinguishability. Doing a colorblind test with only about 5% L-cone functionality becomes quite difficult. Not being able to identify the colors of the plates that test for protonomaly now becomes the norm instead of an exception. Many plates' numbers are just not distinguishable anymore from the background colors, and whenever you can still see a slight difference, you have to concentrate a lot and come closer to the screen or move far away from it in order to better identify the number. Basically, instead of intuitively being able to tell trichromatic colors apart, you are starting to struggle a lot. With a moderate protonomaly, your color vision already starts to count as a textbook color vision deficiency and you will encounter many color-related problems in everyday life. Only very strong and contrasting colors will look like distinct trichromatic hues to you. But if colors are too murky dark, equiluminant or in another unfavorable context, many hues and colors will look very similar. This is what it means to have a moderate color vision deficiency. Finally, every severity below approximately 5% L-cone functionality starts to count as a strong protonomaly. Taking a rather low percentage of L-cone functionality as an example, you've basically become a protonope, which is synonymous to having a red-green dichromacy. Any hue description that's not yellowish or bluish feels weird. As if someone just invented different fantastical color names for what's basically the same two hues, just slightly darker or lighter. Yellow and green are now identical, cyan is just another white, magenta is a slightly lighter blue, purple has become even more of a lie than before, and red could also be a dark yellow or dark green. The separation of the hue spectrum into all its intermediate trichromatic hues doesn't even make sense with such a strong protonomaly. With a low percentage of L-cone functionality like this, every trichromatic hue collapses into just about four categories – yellowish, bluish, white and black. Such being the case, you will always fail a colorblind test with strong protonomaly. The colorblind tests plates that test for protonomaly now unanimously lack identifiable numbers. And if at all, you might just see contours of a figurative shadow of a number or mistakenly imagine one being there within the random assortment of dots. No matter how much you concentrate, you will still fail such a colorblind test and the result will be strong protanomaly, even if you get one plate's number right by a piece of good luck. 
having a fruitful discussion about color with a normal trichromat becomes almost impossible, especially if that someone uses unconventional names for colors and colors as a method of communication without much more explanation. Just asking you to bring the green and not the yellow cup can become an inevitable struggle without any other clues. The best way to accommodate this common and preventable struggle is by trichromats being more mindful of how color vision deficient people experience their Umwelt, their visual world. With this understanding of the great variability within each type of color vision deficiency, we have to keep in mind that there are about 200 million color vision deficient people currently living on this planet and a large percentage of these people have an anomalous trichromacy that falls somewhere on a spectrum like this, be it the L-cone anomalous proto-anomaly, the M-cone anomalous deuteranomaly or the rarer S-cone anomalous tritonomaly, let alone monochromacy and achromatopsia. Every one of the people affected by protonomaly, for example, possesses a slightly different type and severity of it by pure genetic and circumstantial probability. This means that even within the colorblind community, individual variance is the norm, and not everybody sees the world in the same anomalous colors. As a consequence, no colorblindness is created equal. Rather, as I've shown thus far, Colorblindness is better classified as a variable spectrum on which one can fall on. Just calling someone colorblind when their color vision is only mildly to already moderately protonomalous isn't doing them any justice. Any mislabeling can do more harm than good, because it may lead to false beliefs about oneself or about someone living with a color vision deficiency. That's why it's important to get yourself officially tested, if you suspect yourself to be color vision deficient, to figure out whether you're only mildly or already moderately to strongly color vision deficient and to identify which type of color vision deficiency you actually have. It will help you better understand yourself and it'll help others better understand your specific struggles with color. And if you're a normal trichromat, understanding the many different types and the severity spectra of the major color vision deficiencies is also important so that you can accommodate color vision deficient people and realize their day-to-day -day struggles, even if it's just for avoiding sometimes annoying and repetitive questions towards colorblind people like, what color is this? When the answer is obvious to someone who's even remotely knowledgeable about color vision deficiencies. Now, if you are interested in my application, Custom Color Vision, that I've used to easily simulate all of these different color vision deficiencies through simple images in real time, you can visit Custom Color Vision's trailer that should pop up right about now in the top right corner. I've recently released the update version 1.21, which introduces many new features, like interlaced colors for example. Many of my upcoming videos will be about these amazing features that are unique to custom color vision, as well as many other interesting color and sensory perception related topics. I am Ukwai, and I will show you how to reshape and enhance your sensory experiences, because it is nothing but our senses that connect us to this world. Have fun watching and learning all these amazing colors. Thanks for watching.